Like when I take drum solos in the background gigs, I'm just like, I want to be in the audience so bad right. to know what the fuck that feels like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did they forget the song? Yeah.
Hi, everybody. Congratulations. Welcome to all. I'm Carol Becker, Dean of the School of the Arts. As is our practice, I will begin with our land acknowledgement. The School of the Arts recognizes Manhattan as part of the ancestral and traditional homeland of the Lene, Lenape, and Wappinger people. And while acknowledging the traumas of displacement and migration, occupation, exclusion, erasure, and systemic discrimination that has occurred in the U.S. soil, we have committed ourselves to actively addressing these historical and ongoing issues through education and equitable representation. I now want to thank the amazing Columbia University Jazz Ensemble for their extraordinary skill. I see them packing up back there, but I was going to ask them to take a bow. <laughs> um, and for their deconstructed version of, uh, of Elgar's Pomp and Circumstance, uh, adapted for us by composer and musician and faculty Chris Washburn from the music department several years ago. It's become a tradition. So will they take a bow? Will you all take a bow? Where are you? <laughs> I can't see them. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I don't like our fellow artists to be hidden behind a screen, so I don't want them to come out. Okay, so welcome to our graduating class of 2023. And to those watching on live stream around the world, and thank you, Kelson Productions, because you always do such a great job. We are also completely thrilled to see parents and friends and partners and faculty and staff all gathered together here for this really monumental celebration of the collective achievement of our graduates. And of course, we are beyond ecstatic to welcome the incomparable writer, David Sedaris. who most generously agreed to be our graduation speaker today. And David Sedaris is someone we admire for his creativity, wit, and originality. And I've known David since he was himself a student at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, where he came to study painting as an undergraduate and left as a writer who also performs the written word. So great in the spirit of art schools to completely deviate from what his original intention was and then to do it with such flair. Um, we're extremely grateful uh, to have him with us for this historic graduation and we are also very pleased to welcome his guests today, Hugh Hamrick, Don Erickson, and Amy Sedaris. And Liz Harris, Chair of Writing, will formally introduce David in just a bit. <laughs> I'd also like to acknowledge our arts and science colleagues who are here with us today, the Executive Vice President of Arts and Science, Amy Hungerford, as well as Sarah Cole, Dean of Humanities. Thank you so much for coming. Graduation this year is comprised of students from 31 states of the US, as well as from 30 countries. And we cherish and value this national and global breadth that so reflects the spirit of the 21st century and it enriches the education of all of us. So we're so thrilled to have all of you here and to have all your families here today too. This is the biggest graduation in the school's history and also it is my last as Dean of the School of the Arts. So it's very meaningful to me. I have joyfully served as Dean of this amazing school since 2007. I've watched it grow and I've watched it evolve and it's now time for me to return to teaching and writing full time. So I began my art school adventure many years ago when I fell in love with another art school, the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, another great art school, where I taught and eventually became the dean and executive vice president. And then I came to Columbia and I fell in love with this art school. And it has been an honor, a joy, at times a challenge, to navigate Columbia University on behalf of such an extraordinary creative student body and faculty. And we've done brilliantly together 
and now are one of the truly great art schools in the world, without question. A community of working artists and writers and scholars and filmmakers and theater practitioners and as close as you get to heaven as I can imagine. It is always a daring experiment and a true leap of faith to come to art school. When choosing such a path, you have to trust in the importance of your own creativity above everything else. And you have to believe that time spent developing your, sk your skills with a brilliant and accomplished faculty will be essential to your ability to succeed in the art worlds that you have chosen. And you have to be certain that having developed these potentialities in yourself, you will be prepared to engage the most pressing issues of our times in unique forms so that you can become an artist whose practice is truly, truly valuable to society. Your job as artists is to keep your imaginations alive and engaged, to take risks and to thrive on challenges. Always remember that without imagination, we cannot envision what does not as yet exist. So imagination really is truly the most essential tool for human and societal development, and that is your expertise. So let's salute the students who have taken such leaps and are receiving their degrees today. Let's congratulate the class of 2023 for their boundless courage, originality, boldness, audacity, and conviction. You've all worked so hard and you've achieved so much already. So this one's for you. In the last weeks, all the school's programs have been enlivened by end of the year festivals, exhibitions, performances, and publications. We thank our students for their brilliantly directed, acted, conceptualized, managed, and produced Columbia New Plays Festival, as well. You notice that the directors and the actors are not shy? No. Okay. Um, Columbia New Plays Festival, as well as the directors and actors' thesis productions and showcases. We thank you for the beautifully written and designed Writer's Thesis Anthology 2023, as well as for the Monumental Visual Arts and Sound Arts Thesis Exhibition. We greatly admire the astounding week of scholarly thesis presentations by film and media studies students at Zoom In, as well as the ambitious Columbia University Film Festival with new short films, screenplays, and television writing by our incredibly accomplished filmmakers, directors, and writers that went on for several days at the Lentfest Center for the Arts and culminated on Monday night at Lincoln Center. After today, you will all be our alumni and forever part of the Columbia University School of the Arts. So many of our recent alumni have gone on to enormous success. At times, such success comes early, and sometimes it comes later. But with tenacity and hard work, it comes. I'm going to acknowledge just a very few of the long list of alumni achievements just during this past year in film. Joyland by Saeem Sadiq won the, won the 2022 Jury Prize at Cannes and went on to win Best International Feature at the Spirit Awards. It secured distribution and it's currently opening in theaters across the U.S. Also at Cannes, alumni Antonetta Alamat Kusianovic and Frank Grazian won the Camera d'Or for Marina which also took the 2022 Gotham Award. Alumna Jasmine Fritas Tenucci was given special jury mention at Cannes as well for August Sky. While three television series worked on by eight alumni won 2022 Emmy Awards, the fourth and final season of Succession has been executive produced by Emmy winner film alum Scott Ferguson, with episodes directed by Oscar-nominated alumni Shari Springer Berman, and Bob Pulcini, who met here at the School of the Arts, and they were just here two weeks ago to speak about succession. At Sundance, the film Radical, produced by alumnus Ben O'Dell and written and directed by alumnus Christopher Zala, 
won the festival favorite, while the Eternal Memory, produced by alumna Tatan donors, won the World Cinema Documentary Grand Jury Prize, and Olive Enwuso took home the NHK Award for Lady. In the film and media studies world, Yi Fei Suin, Ting Zhao, Zhou, and Yang Ao all won awards from the Society for Cinema and Media Studies, while the Cathedral by alumnus Ricky D'Ambros won the John Cassavetes Prize for the Independent Spirits Award. In theater, nine productions involving 46 School of the Arts students, faculty, and alumni were nominated for Tonys. A Strange Loop, produced by alumna Barbara Whitman, won a Tony for Best Musical and Best Book of a Musical. <laughs> Pavaliska received a Guggenheim in Drama and Performance Studies. Clarence Coe landed the Arnold Weissenberger New Play Award. Shayuk Misha Kraus Huri received the 2022 Mark O'Donnell Prize and the 2022 Relentless Musical Award. Alumnus actor Mark Marcel Spears is now starring on Broadway. In fact, <laughs> You guys, you la have to let me finish. In Fat Ham. <laughs> Anya Banerjee is the series lead on NBC's The Blacklist. Tamara, Tamara Donakili is the lead actor in HBO Max series, The Winning Time. <laughs> okay, recently announced, oh, and visual art and sound arts. Recently announced alumnus Kamru Zaram won the much coveted Rome Prize. Alumni Samantha Ney, Pamela Council, Betsy Damon, Tony Chirinos, and Jessica Seagal all received Guggenheims, and 11 alumni exhibited their work at Art Basel Miami, while two sound arts alumni, Julian Day and Casuela Powerhouse, were featured in the Sydney Festival in Australia. Alumna Lauren Covey spearheaded a community-based art and archival practice called Sonic Portraits of New York, using sound as a therapeutic tool to restore and build confidence for members of marginalized communities. In writing, K.O. Kalia Young received a Guggenheim in nonfiction, Matthew Gelman Siri, Gerald Johnson, E.J. Koo were all awarded National Endowment for the Arts Fellowships. E.J. Koo also won the grand prize from the Literature Translation Institute of Korea and the 2022 Association for Asian American Books Studies Book Award. And while numerous new books of fiction, poetry, and creative nonfiction by writing alumni were published in 2022, Rebecca Donner won the 2022 National Critics Circle Award for all the frequent troubles of our days. And this is such a small sample of achievements. There is so much more. So let's congratulate all of our alumni from last year. I hope that this very abbreviated list is inspiring and hopeful to all of you as you leave Columbia and to your families who are wondering how life will go after you leave Columbia. I want you to know they're gonna do great. There's no question. Because we have bonded with you as students, fellow artists, scholars, colleagues, and alumni, we are very sad to see you leave. But we are also confident that we have prepared you well to enter your various professions and to challenge the boundaries of form while inventing new ones along the way. In a short time, you, the class of 2022, also will become part of this illustrious group. No one except your friends and family will ever be as proud of you or as excited about your new work and accomplishments in the world as the faculty and staff at the School of the Arts. So remember to stay close to us and always let us know how your work is going and how your careers are progressing. Speaking of families and friends, let us acknowledge those without whom many of you would never have completed this most essential <laughs> completed this most essential part of your development as artists. We all need people close to us who believe in us and support us in all ways. No one succeeds alone. You, our families and friends, all have been essential to this process. 
will those families, friends, partners, companions, and loved ones of our graduates who are either physically here or with us tonight virtually, please stand so our graduates can thank you for all you've given them. Stand up. They could never have done this without you. Now a moment to also to thank the faculty. I, I would venture to say that there is no more devoted and successful faculty anywhere in the art world than ours. All are working artists practicing and engaged in many forms, yet they nonetheless give so much of their time, imagination, and wisdom to our students. They transmit knowledge of their disciplines but also the knowledge of what it means to be a practicing artist, writer, scholar, filmmaker, producer, art practitioner in the world, and to do so for an entire lifetime. So let's ask the faculty who are present to stand up, including the ones on stage. Come on, you guys, so we can be acknowledged. It really takes our entire dedicated team to make graduation possible. So let me first thank Layla Mayer, our Dean of Students and Alumni Affairs, and Trent Pollard, Associate Director of Student Affairs, Herbert Hughes, Jessica Pearson, Gavin Browning, Peter Vaughn, and the school's entire IT team, our Dean of Development, Roberta Albert, Dean of Admissions and Financial Aid, Julie Dubrow, and our Director of Communications, Christina Tate, our theater student stage managers. You know, we didn't used to have, we didn't used to look so good before we started hiring our own theater people to manage us on stage, so. <laughs> now we're professional, we look much more professional. Um, so Hannah Yankovic and Miranda Soledad Takeda. And I would like to thank the directors of academic administration, who with the chairs will be facilitating the handing of diplomas today. Hannah Sifu in film. <laughs> Lauren Elmore, Lauren Elmore in theater. <laughs> Laura Mosquera, visual arts. And Frank Winslow, Frank Winslow in writing. I also want to thank our assistant DAAs and other program staff who participated, as well as the university events management team. And I want to thank the very, very long list of volunteers. So, okay, getting moving along. Thank you also <laughs> to the offices of the Interdisciplinary Arts Council, the IAC that is the mainstay of student life at the School of the Arts. And of course, I must acknowledge our brilliant Dean of Academic Administration and Planning, Jana Wright. Thank you for everything. <laughs> Let's now really begin. Opening the program will be the Chair of Writing, Liz Harris. A wonderfully accomplished author of numerous books and essays, the interlocutor of nonfiction dialogues, and a New Yorker writer herself for 25 years. And Liz Harris is gonna introduce David Sedaris. Good evening, everyone, and once again, congratulations. Writers, yes. <laughs> I'm here to introduce our main speaker, David Sedaris, whom I'm confident, even without his name being splashed on the big screen, needs no introduction. I've always been grateful for public speakers who manage to slip a few laughs in their, into their otherwise weighty orations and I've usually tried to do the same, but I'm not going to try this evening. There are a few authors you only have to mention by name to elicit a broad grin, but our speaker is one of them. 
His 13 books and innumerable person, personal essays and articles have been read and admired around the globe. His books with great titles like Let's Explore Diabetes with Owls have regularly shot to the top of the bestseller list. He's been elected to the American Academy of Arts and Letters, received the Thurber Prize for American Humor, and his prodigious storytelling gifts so impressed one critic that he called Sedaris the preeminent humorist of his generation. In a graduation speech he himself delivered at Oberlin College, which was presenting him with an honorary degree, he told many funny stories, mostly at his own expense. A college dropout who at one point was heavily into drugs, he eventually turned a corner and graduated from the Art Institute of Chicago. By then he was 30 years old. He told the audience that he was incredibly grateful for the education he received, though at that time he said, the school is not that strong on academics. It might be different now, he continued, but in 1984, if you could draw Snoopy on a cocktail napkin, you were in. <laughs> the second oldest of six children, Sedaris writes boldly and affectionately and sometimes sharply about his family. More than any other writer I can think of, his attachment to his family and their centrality in his life color a huge swath of his work. This is true whether his subject is his, suburb, is, is his suburban upbringing in North Carolina, his many, many jobs, or his sojourns in Paris, London, New York, or England's West Sussex, is that right? West Sussex, uh, where he and his partner now live. Several weeks ago, on the number one train on the way to class, I was reading the title essay of Sedaris's 2000 book, Me Talk Pretty One Day, about his futile attempt to learn French in France. So many passages were so funny that I couldn't help but loudly cackle, despite some dirty looks from my fellow passengers. I couldn't stop. I closed the book, but couldn't resist opening it up again a few minutes later. It happened again. I tried to tuck it into my purse, but it was too good. Out it came, and so it went all the way up to 116th Street. Cackle, stop, cackle, stop. If any of you were in this car on that train, don't blame me. It was the fault of the author. You're a wizard, David Sedaris, and we're delighted you are here. And now, the man himself. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> it isn't easy to write a commencement address. I have no doubt that many of you seated before me will give one or two of your own at some point. Then you'll see for yourselves. The pay sucks too, but still you'll do it because it's an honor. The hard part is that you're speaking to two very distinct audiences. There are the graduates, and then there are their parents. Group one, when asked where they went to school, will likely answer, in the New York area? <laughs> or, um, Columbia? I'm sorry, what did you say? Columbia? <laughs> it's like someone asked, what is that blister on your upper lip? <laughs> um, herpes? This happens at Harvard and Yale as well, and I cannot for the life of me understand it. You say the name of your school like it's something to be ashamed of, when, in fact, I'm sorry, but it's just the opposite. And you all do this. I was shocked a few years back when I met a young woman at a book signing. Did you have a degree, I asked? Oh, yes, she told me. I went to Brown. She said it matter-of-factly, and when I pointed out that Ivy League graduates are never so forthcoming, she said, oh, no, not Brown University. I went to Brown College in Toronto. <laughs> they misspelled my degree on my diploma and wrote that I'd majored in broadcasting. <laughs> my father was furious, made him correct it. 
It is safe to assume that your names and degrees will be properly spelled on the diplomas that will soon be handed out, not that you, the graduates, will notice one way or the other. I'm going to guess that exactly none of you will have it framed and hang it on your wall, which I get. Unless you're a doctor or lawyer, it looks sort of desperate. <laughs> and not for your parents, though, many of whom will likely have copies made and hand them out to relatives so they can hang one on their wall as well. See that? My niece went to Columbia. They won't mumble and hedge, and neither will your parents. They're proud to tell people their child went to school here. Hell, I'm proud just to be giving this address. Have you given one before, people ask? Well, yes, I have, as a matter of fact. I tell them I gave one at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, one at SUNY Binghamton, one at Oberlin, and one at Princeton. <laughs> then I say, did I mention the Princeton one? That was before Columbia. <laughs> of all the above, my only failure was at Binghamton. It was a December graduation. And I advised the students that while they were still young and good looking, they should have as much sex as possible. <laughs> Even if you don't like the other person all that much, I said. I suggested that while they were at it, they should also do lots of drugs. It was. It was sound advice, but a good two-thirds of the audience had flown in from Southeast Asia. Of the remaining third, most were under the age of eight. <laughs> My message did not play to the crowd at SUNY Binghamton, and in retrospect, I should have toured the campus first or talked to the dean. At my last speech, an angry man, the father of the one conservative student ever to attend Oberlin, <laughs> rushed the stage and tried to attack me, angry over a joke I had told. Looking back, my most successful address was at the School of the Art Institute. And what made it good was that I could relate. I had gone to school there myself, so knew what it was like to be a student there to have parents in the audience. My degree was a BFA, and what I mainly remember about my graduation day was being scared, which was funny. I hadn't felt that way before school or even during it when we had crits, which were genuinely terrifying. For those of you in other disciplines, end of semester fine arts critiques are when the inmates get to run the asylum. <laughs> it's rare to leave a crit unbloodied, 20 years from now, you'll likely still recall some of the abuse heaped upon you by one or more of your classmates. Then you'll maybe Google them <laughs> and think, hmm, pretty strong opinion for the assistant manager of a Marshalls in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I was an older student, enrolled when I was 27 for painting and sculpture. When I graduated at 30, I was mainly writing, which I'd been doing fanatically for a decade. I always figured my post-college life would be pretty much like my pre-college one. This is to say I'd work whatever measly job I could find, preferably one I didn't have to think about too hard, and then come home and sit at my desk until I passed out. It was a perfectly fine existence. I had friends. There was a small but growing audience for my work. But now that I had a degree, people would be expecting more of me. They were people who, for the most part, knew nothing about writing or painting. Not that I could fault them for it. They weren't creative in that way. And popular culture always gets art wrong. We've all seen the movie where the red-hot 25-year-old has his big opening at the Soho Gallery, even though there aren't galleries in Soho anymore, <laughs> and no one gets their own show at age 25. Cut to the artist drinking champagne as the dealer trots over, clutching an empty sheet of peel-off red dots. The collectors have already snapped it all up, she pants, and the work my goodness, derivative doesn't begin to do it justice. <laughs> this one's called Contemplation 2, 
a gallery assistant will say to a sophisticated-looking couple who nods. There's always a hint of phoniness about them, a suggestion that they're the only true audience for fine art. I like the lines, one of them will say. I find Timothy's work very evocative. On an episode of Sex in the City I watched on a plane once, Charlotte has to persuade a reclusive and temperamental painter to have a show at her gallery. She pays a visit to the guy's studio and finds that he's now focusing exclusively on vaginas. They're not super realistic. If Georgia O'Keeffe made pictures of caves with the brush held between her toes, this is what they'd look like. <laughs> the most ridiculous part of the episode was that the exhibit was seen as controversial, a scandal when by the late 1990s, no one would have been outraged by vagina paintings. Why isn't there a GLAD or an anti-defamation league for art? For whatever reason, most of what's on television and movies is closer to parody than to anything approaching the work that's actually being talked about. So the people we know who aren't in our fields have to rely more often than not on cliches and stereotypes. The starving artist is a big one. My goddaughter is a starving artist in Brooklyn. <laughs> Should anyone ever refer to you this way, I think the only appropriate response is to throw up on them. <laughs> then say, if I was starving, why would I have had all those ramen noodles in my stomach? <laughs> Inspiration is another cliche. What inspires you? When I hear this, I think of something the painter Chuck Close once said. Inspiration is for amateurs. The rest of us just show up and get to work. All the best ideas come out of process. The most damaging misconceptions about an artistic life are those regarding failure, and it's those that haunted me after I left the Art Institute graduate with a degree in mechanical engineering or biochemistry, and if the economy's good, you'll soon have a job in your field. Very few people, though, publish a book or have their play produced three months out of school. It just doesn't work that way. It's the same with visual art and filmmaking. You go to college, you graduate, and then you put in the hours, by which I mean years. To support yourself, you maybe wait tables or clean houses. Maybe you work as an assistant manager at Marshall's <laughs> in Chattanooga, Tennessee, which is actually a lovely town and has three separate establishments where you can get drunk and throw axes. <laughs> People will want to put a timer on your success, and you can't let them get to you. I was told by my writing teacher, a man named Jim McManus, that if I remained focused and wrote as if my life depended upon it, when the time was right, someone would call and ask if they could publish my book. It sounds very pie in the sky. I mean, how would they know my number? <laughs> but because I was in 1987 and still am completely incapable of promoting myself, I not only believed Jim, but felt relieved. It seemed I could just write, and the rest would eventually take care of itself. Of course, not everyone was as patient as me and my former teacher. There was my dad, a sort of anti-cheerleader, who'd been rooting against me my entire life. <laughs> there was this woman I knew in Chicago, a meeting planner for medical organizations. I'll call Marjorie. We met when I was a freshman at the Art Institute. I was working part-time for a wood refinisher and was hired to strip the oak in her dining room. Later, I cleaned her house and would do odd jobs for her. Marjorie was 10 years older than me, and I liked that she was so different from the crowd I went to school with, square and dependable, with tightly permed hair and oversized glasses. Marjorie favored moo-moos and smoked extra-long, extra-thin cigarettes that unintentionally made her hands look huge, like mitts. She had a framed picture of a clown in her, dine in her living room and a three-inch-tall porcelain ballerina displayed, unironically, 
Beneath a glass dome near the sound system, she regularly popped Kenny G CDs into. Though our tastes were wildly different, we became close friends. Marjorie had a good sense of humor and graduated from Loyola with a double major in, major in history and Russian. She saw lots of plays and movies. She read. I recall picking a book off her shelf when I was dusting it one afternoon and coming upon this highlighted quote by Soren Kierkegaard. Man is spirit. But what is spirit? Spirit is a self. But what is the self? The self is a relation that relates itself to itself, or is the relations relating itself to itself in the relation. The self is not the relation, but is the relations relating itself to itself. If, however, the relation relates itself to itself, this relation is the positive third, and that is the self. I remember asking Marjorie what this meant, then trying to weigh her answer against the sign she had hanging on the wall of her home office that read, you don't have to be crazy to work here, but it helps. <laughs> the thing is, people are contradictions. Three years after graduating from the Art Institute, I moved to New York City. I figured I'd get a job of some sort, but it was hard because I can't really do anything. Never learn to drive or operate a cash register. I type, but only with one finger, and have to look at the keyboard while doing it. Just before my money ran out, I found work as an elf at Macy's Herald Square. <laughs> I didn't get the job because I had a Bachelor of Arts degree. They hired me because I'm short. <laughs> a week before Christmas, Marjorie sent me a letter. It arrived just as I was leaving from my shift, and I read it in the employee cafeteria while on my afternoon break. I am writing you as a friend, she began, as someone who loves and cares about you. She then told me that I needed to quit writing. You're 33 years old and have to realize that it is never going to happen for you, she said. The letter didn't make me angry because it was true. Marjorie loved me, cared about me too. That didn't mean I had to take her shitty advice, though. <laughs> I'd been writing every day for the past 13 years and could no sooner quit than I could stop getting up in the morning or early afternoon. <laughs> on Christmas, I wrote on vacation. The day that I started doing it, my life began. I recognized that immediately. Expressing myself on paper, choosing this word over that one, gave me a sense of purpose and community, not just with a handful of writers I knew, but with all the authors of all the books that I read and admired, both living and dead. It was the cord that connected me to the world and made it mine. The day I received Marjorie's letter, I was a better writer than I'd dead been the day before, and that in itself was an accomplishment. My work hadn't appeared anywhere worth mentioning, but neither did it deserve to. This was a process, and the goal was to simply keep doing it, to learn from everything I read, and to improve. Shortly before leaving Chicago, I was hired by the Art Institute to teach a creative writing class. I wasn't qualified, but someone backed out at the last minute, and Jim McManus kindly suggested me as a replacement. At school, I wore a tie and carried a briefcase. I asked my students to address me as Mr. Sedaris, because all my life I had wanted to be called that. <laughs> a year later, in the Macy's cafeteria, Marjorie's letter on the table in front of me, I wore a forest green velvet costume with a matching hat that had sequins on it. At work, we had to go by our elf names, and mine was Crumpet. This was hardly the New York life I had planned for myself. It was the one I wound up with, though, and for that, I am eternally grateful. When I told people about my job at Macy's, they laughed. Every day at work, something outrageous happened, 
and I recorded it all in my diary. A few years later, when I was working for a moving company, a guy who had heard me read once called to ask if I had anything Christmassy that might work for a local radio show he had in Chicago. I recorded bits of the diary I'd kept while working at Macy's, and after airing it on his local NPR station, he put it on a national program called Morning Edition. Ten million people heard it, including an editorial assistant at Little Brown who looked me up in the phone book and called to ask if I could have a manuscript he could possibly read and consider publishing. Well, actually, I said, opening my desk drawer, I've got one right here. Not long afterward, the New Yorker rang and asked if I might consider writing for them. Let me think about it. Yes, I said. <laughs> I have a friend who teaches acting at a small college in North Carolina and who says that it's a microaggression to tell people their hard work will eventually pay off. <laughs> True, there are those who will fall by the wayside. You can never underestimate the power of luck, being in the right place at the right time. But I think the work hard and then work harder formula is still the best one going. I have no doubt that those of you seated before me will have your own books published. Your plays will be produced. You'll have shows and galleries and museums. Audiences will race to the movies you make or act in, or read the articles you write. If it can happen for me, I guarantee it can happen for anyone. And when it does, there'll be people in your life who will somehow only get wind of your bad reviews, never your good ones who will say, oh, I stopped reading The New Yorker ages ago. It hasn't been any good since the late 1970s. <laughs> For a while afterwards, theirs might be the voices in your head when you sit down to work each morning. We all get kicked around. We all need something to cling to occasionally, especially at the beginning of our careers. And I hope that when you start to question yourself, you will remember that if nothing else, you went to Columbia, <laughs> an extraordinary school with first-rate teachers that is notoriously hard to get into and only accepts people who show great promise. Should you ever forget this, I'm sure your parents will be more than happy to remind you. David, that was great. That was really great. <laughs> that was really great. Okay. Now, the conferring of degrees. A very important moment. The chairs of the programs, each are going to speak on behalf of their programs. And then, with the assistance of the directors of academic administration, they will present the degrees to all our students. And this is the order. Jack Lechner for film, MFAs, and MA students in film and media studies, assisted by Hannah Sefu. <laughs> Anne Bogart for theater. St she's standing in today for Brian Kulik, and assisted by Lauren Elmore. <laughs> Nicola Lopez for visual and sound arts, assisted by Laura Mosquera. And Liz Harris for writing, assisted by Frank Winslow. So I want to thank you again, David. It was really brilliant and really just the right thing for today. It helped me. I want to go home and start writing again. We will begin with Jack Lechner, Chair of Film.
Thank you, Carol. Uh, I'm Jack Leshner. I'm the chair of the film division. Uh, because film comes earlier in the alphabet than theater, visual, and sound art and writing, I'm condemned to be the first chair to speak. At last year's commencement, I had to follow Laurie Anderson. This year, I have to follow David Sedaris. Thanks a lot, alphabetical order. Anyone who's taken one of my classes at Columbia, and you know who you are, uh, knows that I lose my place in my uh, speech. Um, knows that there are many different ways to structure a movie. There are chapter-based movies, spectacle-based movies, time lasagnas, and pass-the-baton movies. There are one-act movies like Do the Right Thing and The Farewell. There are two-act movies like Life is Beautiful and The Lobster. I even worked on a five-act movie, Four Weddings and a Funeral. But there's one structure we come back to again and again, the three-act movie, which probably accounts for 80% of all American cinema. In its most classical form, the three-act movie follows a protagonist who is trying really hard to do something. The protagonist is faced with conflict from an antagonistic force which disrupts their status quo. The protagonist uh, must try harder and harder in order to achieve their goal, taking ever greater risks and encountering ever greater jeopardy along the way. By the third act, the protagonist has had to dig deep into their own resources, discovering qualities they didn't know they possessed. At the end of the movie, they may or may not have gotten what they wanted, but they usually realize they've gotten what they needed. Graduating class of film students, your story is a classically structured three-act movie. You came to Columbia School of the Arts to hone your skills, to find collaborators, to learn from the faculty and each other. Very quickly, your status quo was disrupted by a formidable force of antagonism. The global pandemic was an obstacle that forced all of you to draw upon your inner resources in order to accomplish your goals. And amazingly, you did. You rose to the occasion over and over again and created astonishing work despite the overwhelming odds against you. You found ways to help each other even when you were communicating by Zoom across the globe and you built strong collaborations that will endure long past today. You nailed your third act, and you got what you needed. But wait, this turns out not to be a one-off movie, but the first episode of a franchise with a cliffhanger. <laughs> Just when it seemed your antagonist had been satisfyingly dispatched and a happy ending was in sight, a new obstacle was thrown in your path. You started Columbia with a pandemic, and now you're leaving with a Writers Guild strike that has effectively <laughs> shut down much of the American entertainment industry. It's a twist ending worthy of M. Night Shyamalan. <laughs> International film students who had planned to use their OPT visas to work in a LA or New York now have to think seriously about returning to their home countries instead, while US film students decide they're a lot more interested in working in documentary TV series than they ever realized. <laughs> Here's where the MA film students are breathing a sigh of relief. They can walk straight into their happy ending, or at least into their much anticipated sequel, episode two, PhD. But the good news for the MFA film students is that your sequel is right around the corner. All strikes eventually end, and every time they do, the business bounces back stronger than ever, and usually with better terms for the people who work in it. Right now, the strike may seem like an obstacle to you, but in a few years when you're negotiating your deal for your series or your feature, I suspect you'll look back at the striking writers with genuine gratitude. And this, too, feels like something out of a classically structured movie. Structure guru Robert McKee likes to ask the question, what's the worst possible thing that could happen to this character, and how could it turn into the best thing? You've already answered that question once, and now it's time to ask it again. I know you're up to the challenge because you've already proved yourselves to the very highest standards. I can't adequately convey how proud the faculty and staff are of what you've achieved and the grace with which you've achieved it. Each one of you has completed a hero's journey. To me, each one of you is a hero. And speaking of heroes, it is now my pleasure to introduce Director of Academic Administration, Hannah Seifu, who will call up the graduates in film. Hi, my filmies. 
I'm waiting for the first student to come up. I'm, we're going to start with the Film and Media Studies MA students. Asia Abdusater. <laughs> Timothy Amatuli. <laughs> Sinead Paahi Nora Unai. Oh, this Sinead, I'm sorry, Sinead. <laughs> Zha Ying Bao. Kaylee DeFritas. Tara Ibrahimian. Molly Follett. Ryan Grundyke. Emily Harold. Chin Fei Ho, Ming Shua Chiang, Jackson Sun Ji Li, Lian Liao, Liu Liu, Bjorn Long. Molly Murta. Jareen Sun. Asia Amjad Said. Shujing Zhao. That's for my MAs. Now we'll start with our, we'll end with our MFAs. Jordan Anstat. Munir Atala. Omar Ben David. Anika Benkov. Eliza Brugger. Chi oh Yang Chang. Junlin Chen, Valerias Contreras, Angeline Joel DiMambro, Major Dorfman, Ivan Durovich. Benjamin Chung Yi Erksley. Emily Elizabeth Ang. Kathy Eskenazi Mitrani. Stephanie Falkis. Pasha Gomberg. Samantha Lori Glass. Andrew Golden. Wesley Andre Goodridge. Winner of this year's best film in the film festival. Spencer Karen Grammer. April Griffin. Kevin Heiflin. Emma Hall Martin. Woo! Mathilde Alia Adukor. Dong Ren Hong. Jake Hebner. Woo! Kayla Izoba. Shan Jion. 
Robert Jones. Minkyu Khan. Ji Hook Kim. Yoko Komodo. Kinder Labat. Juan Palo Lacena. Ryder Laskin. Kevin Luan Lee. Zhao Anqi Lu. Wang Zhen Lu. Bruno Matos Rubais. Hazel McGibbon. Ethan Mermelstein. Ayman Mibiko. Caroline Moore. Eric Henry Nelson. Patrick Nichols. Should have stayed up in the front at Cuff, Patrick. That was a lot of awards, bro. <laughs> Adelaide Palancourt. William Pink. Ariel Chi. Mimi Rich. Emily Shua Ruan. Asia Seglovich. Samia Singh. Alexis Stogjil. Andrea Studinger. Drew Sud. William Turner. Felix Van Kahn. Ricardo Varona. Chan Hen Yang. Alexander Yaber. Bohan Zhang. Thank you so much. Peter Brook, the, of course, the phenomenon of theater is engaged when a person walks across an empty space while someone else is watching. Right here, right now, we find ourselves collectively present within the distinct conditions of a theatrical event. And amidst this rapture of presence and witnessing, the act of speaking or vocalization has the potential to manifest something truly extraordinary. In that spirit, I declare congratulations to the actors, playwrights, directors, stage managers, dramaturgs, and producers of the theater program for reaching this momentous and significant milestone. A large group of family, colleagues, and well-wishers have gathered to witness each of you as you walk across the stage to receive your hard and well-earned diploma. The memories that result from how you move and how you occupy this occasion within this theatrical ritual matter. The multiple meanings of your walk will accumulate as it's happening, no pressure. <laughs> but to successfully negotiate this immense pressure with equanimity and presence is exactly what you've been training for here at Columbia School of the Arts. 
you now possess the tools to produce resonant theater within the ever-increasing pressure of our contemporary world, no matter which side of the footlights you occupy. Be courageous, be kind, be specific, be truthful, be patient. Brian Kulik, the chair of the theater program, who would normally be standing here, but due to a dental emergency, invited me to take his place, asked me to convey to you his hearty congratulations and his one piece of graduation advice, which is, don't forget to floss. <laughs> it's now my pleasure to introduce the theater program's director of Ac academic administration, Dr. Lauren Britt Elmore. <laughs> who will read the names of the 2022-23 graduates in theater. It is my honor to read the names of the 2023 graduates Masters of Fine Arts in the Theater Program. I got this, I got this. Adebowale Adebi. Kira Elizabeth Armstrong. Blake Bonilla. Phoebe Brooks. Trey Sean Calhoun. Majita Chanakira. Tija Childs. Riley Jewel Conlin. George Copeland. Taylor Everts. Everts, excuse me, Taylor Everts. Kat Filipov. Charlotte Isabella Francis. Catherine George. Christina Gerla. <laughs> Sydney K. Gee. <laughs> Rebecca Ho. <laughs> Marissa K. Holland. <laughs> Begum Inal. Kim Tae Son. Daphne Charlesy Kynard. Katrina Natasha Lambert. Cal Langston. G. Lay. Tanasia Lewis. <laughs> Sam Lynch. I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it. Anthony Lewis Massa the Fourth. <laughs> Kyle Nes Nelson McClellan. Ali Mims. Eden Elaine Mullins. Goldie Estelle Patrick. Liz. 
Liz Peterson. Joanna Marie Pisano. Caroline Ray Pitts. Sina Porsmael. Mung Yuan Mia Quinn. Amy Rauschwerger. Liv Rigdon. Nicholas George Saxton. Emma Scalacci. J Jacob Sexton. <laughs> Hannah Sheely. DeAndre Chevelle Short. Tene Be Salah. Sage Elizabeth Rose Spitz. Yeah. Ellis Stump. Yeah. Gabriel Scheinert. Yeah. Hey, baby. Joshua C. Thomas. Yeah. There we go. Desi Tibbs. Luce Lorenzana Twig. <laughs> Alexis Michaela Williams. <laughs> Taeun Ya. <laughs> and Esther Zador. <laughs> Congratulations to you all. Many of you, including many of the friends and family members joining us today, are surely sitting there right now with a few burning questions weighing heavily in the pit of your stomach, like, what next? What if? And how will I get there? So the, fu the future is full of these questions, and it's easy to feel overwhelmed. Both in your individual lives, as you look beyond the horizon of graduation, that's today, and also in our collective life, especially as we see political, social, economic, and ecological upheaval on all sides. I'm not going to suggest that you avoid these questions, the what ifs, what nexts, how will I get theirs, or that you hold them at arm's length so that you can get on with things. I suggest instead that you plunge right in and face them head on that you continue doing exactly what you have just spent the last two years putting into practice. These are questions that the whole world is asking right now. What if, what next, and how will we get there? And it turns out that you are the ones who have the answers. So not that you have a neat and tidy answer or even a solution. In fact, it's precisely because you don't have solutions, formulas, algorithms, that you are the ones with the answers. You have what you need and also what we all need to navigate a future that promises some extremely large challenges. You are artists. You have broad, expansive, complex answers. We don't need another solution. We need responses. We need reflections, engagement, exploration, care. We need the spirit that you already have and that you have been exercising every single day 
in your practice as artists? Start with the what if. So, so what if can cause so much anxiety? What if this? What if that? What if you turn, what if you turn the what if into a what, what if? Like a what if? You know? You do this all the time. Like visual artists, you took a, take a look at your thesis show, right? You look all over and it's all full of what if the world like like this? Like what if that happened? What if we did this and then turned it into that and then added this other thing? You are always asking, imagining, what if? With every what if, every time you make something, you create a proposition. It's a proposition for seeing a new world, for moving forward together, for responding to confusion, loss, joy, the unfamiliar. You aren't looking for solutions, you're creating possibilities. So what if is not an anxiety-causing stress question for you, it's a world-opening process of envisioning the possible. What next? Well, does that prospect really daunt you? You do this all the time. You ask what's next, and then you take a step or a jump or a flying leap into whatever lies ahead. How many of you really want to know exactly what comes next? Because I know you. You want to tell us what comes next. And when it's a surprise, again, you're artists, and you embrace the unpredictable. You are experts already in finding inspiration in something that others might see as frightening or ugly or just plain weird. You are experts at getting into a huge mess and then turning it into a party or a discovery or a gem. You're alchemists. How will we get there? It's a good question, especially today. But here again, you have practice. Over the past two years and throughout your whole lives as artists, you have proven again and again that you are masters of improvisation, of finding the incredible in the impossible, of mining doubt and even failure for inspiration, finding your own path, inventing your own tools and your own new ways of working on your own and together in collaboration. You are makers, you're inventors, alchemists, visionaries, and you care. Otherwise, you wouldn't be doing this. You care about your work, you care about the world, and you care about how you relate to it and those around you. If there's any group with which I want to head into this future, asking these crucial, daunting, exciting, thrilling questions, what if, what next, how will we get there, I want it to be with you. So congratulations, good luck, and I can't wait to see what if, what comes next, and how you will take us there. Thank you. Um, I would like to introduce um, the Visual Arts and Sound Arts Program Director of Academic Administration, Laura Mosquera, who will read the names of the 2023 MFA graduates in Visual Arts and Sound Arts. We're way more subdued than theater. <laughs> the unbelievable, handsome, and talented Garrett Scott Ball. <laughs> Ray Barsante. Gladstone Alexander Ezekiel Butler. Kevin Brevard Cobb, Jr. Connor Thomas Dowdle. Nicholas Farhi. Wait a minute. 
Elisheva Gavra. <laughs> Jeffrey Halstead. Char Jure. Calvin Somong Kim. Sang Min Lee. Katarina Loish. Megan Elise Lewick. Anna Ting Moller. Amadeo Morelos Favela. Levi Nelson. Allison Wynn. Paul Rowe. Robert William Rogers. Albert Samrath. Jairo Moises Sosa. Mary Sun. The indestructible Motohiro Takeda. Christopher Michel Torres. Vivian Vivas. Ming Wang. Shuai Yang. Congratulations to the beautiful souls from sound art and visual arts. again. <laughs> ah. As you may or may not have noticed, the chair's divisions are listed alphabetically on the program. Thus writing with its naked and lagging W always goes last. It can't be helped. Each writing chair has to face the fact that by the time they come up to the plate, whatever could be said by our inventive colleagues has already been said, and we are condemned to work with scraps. <laughs> but this year, sitting at my desk waiting for my brain machinery to kick in so I could compose an acceptable speech, I found myself in a state of revolt. God knows that along with the diploma, this, this speech, any speech, celebrating you is an expected and deserved part of the formalities of graduation. A final bouquet thrown to all of you who have worked so hard and subsisted on peanut butter and ramen to get to this moment. But as the years have passed, I felt increasingly dubious about my speech's relevance to my students' actual lives. The fundamental flaw of of graduation speeches is that is the expectation that the speech will impart secret heretofore unremarked wisdom that is wanted or needed by the graduates or at least at the very least that will prevent them from dozing off. <laughs> Having by now given my share of speeches and listened to many more, even brilliant ones, most memorably Timothy O'Donnell's homage a few years ago, 
to Athenaeus's, Athenaeus Kirchner's loopy in, the loopy-inspired 17th century German polymath in whom I shared with Timothy an avid, um, unexplainable interest. I can say with confidence that in the secret advice department, the cupboard is regrettably bare, particularly in an arts program where in the uniquely intimate transactions that take place in the classroom and conferences, the transformative power of the imagination has already been discovered, plumbed, and celebrated. When you scrutinize the horizon for past graduation speeches thought to be memorable, you find lively speeches with unmemorable advice. Steve Jobs, for example, comes up quite a lot. Quote, your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. In other words, remember death. <laughs> As does the Western blogger Reed Drummond. Buckle up. You've got good times and rough seas ahead. It's just part of life, but enjoy the ride and laugh a lot. In other words, forget death. <laughs> Quoted too is the late Chadwick Boseman. Whatever you choose for a career path, remember that the struggles along the way are only meant to shape you for your purpose. In other words, don't just keep your head down. You could do worse than follow George Saunders' advice, though you already know about it. Do all the other things, he says, the ambitious things. Travel, get rich, get famous, swim naked in a wild jungle river after having it tested for monkey poop. But if you do, to the extent you can, err in the direction of kindness. They don't teach you to turn pages here. <laughs> Seriously, here we go. Um, in other words, don't forget the humanity of others. But the real reason that the commonplaces of graduation speeches can seem a bit beside the point is that the transformations they present, particularly in an arts program, have already begun to happen. The unique bond between faculty and student and its potential to transform lives evolves in a way that is sometimes gradual, sometimes immediate. It is received as an electric response to a paragraph in a book, a revelation about a story, a line in a poem, a conversation in a conference. No one thinks your development as a writer is complete, but with luck you have become more of the artist you wanted to become. You are clearer about your weaknesses and strengths and more patient in overcoming obstacles in your path. That is the secret message. They may seem like modest achievements, but they aren't. They are the stuff of everyday artistic experience and will serve you for the rest of your lives. So congratulations again and wishing you joy and good work. Now I'm going to introduce Frank Winslow, the Director of Admi uh, Academic Administration for Writing. I have the distinct honor of reciting the names of the 2023 writing graduates of Columbia University's MFA program. They have the distinct honor of walking to the stage. <laughs> Nafiza. A. Iqbal. Fariha Ahmed. Charles Colin Ainsworth. Violette Alar. Sarah? Yes, yeah, Sarah. Sarah Asalam. Bianca. Asari, Catherine Elizabeth Bo Vinci, Kelly Bridget Canaday, 
Allison Carter Belay. Jackie Claire Charniga. Connie Chen. She Richard Chen. Noah Christopher Cooter. Delia Elizabeth Cruz Kelly. Selden Cummings. Nina Dehan Relich. Chiara Dello Joyo. Rose Natalie Damaris. Marie Frances Denoya Aronson. Chiana Marie Sage Deschamps. Sophie Madeline Des. Elena Marie Dudum. Hey, how you doing? Robert Matthew English. Zachary Raphael Erickson. Rona. N. Figueroa. Anastasia Catherine Gates. Heather Gluck. Hannah Pauline Gold. Devin Madison Goldring. Peyton Lee Harvey. Kayla Christine Hissler. Kayla Renee Hen. Jen Lee Hulo. Kimberly Jen Lee Hulo. David James Hobby the third. Hannah Marie Holden. Maureen Holden. Aaron Suzanne Jackson. Camille Kit Jacobson. Emma Charlotte Jehoda Brown. Benjamin Thomas Knighting Jeffries. I have a card situation, just a second, I'm sorry. I will put them here. Aha, and we continue. Samantha Johns. William Calvin Jones. Kylily Kane Cartman. Michelle Fatima Cosme. Christian Kennedy. Jesse Kite. Mina Khan. Matthew Kimball. Emily Margaret Crone. Jesus Ian Kumamoto. Danielle Leshgold. Rebecca Sarah Levy. Thank you. Olivia Elizabeth Lang. Kendra Leiter Johnson. Kimberly Y. Liu. Odelia Ye Liu.
Amr Aziz Malik. <laughs> Leah Mandel. Thank you very much, Thomas. Thomas Kenyon Marshall. <laughs> Hallie Michelle McDonough. James McGowan. Wyonia McLaren. Abhigna Reddy Muraka. Huh? Kalina Catherine Moore. Emma Leslie Patton. Poto Paramita. Ashley Porus. Peter Raffle. Rachel Riola. Eduardo Andres Rios Pugar. Sierra Nicole Robinson. Go Sierra. Jessica Belinda Rodriguez. Allison Ann Rosa. Robert Joseph Rubsom. Corey Matthew Scarola. Jacob T. Schultz. Anna Schwartzman. Lynn Sharp. Charu Sinha. Remy James Schmidt. Sri Izati Sukarsono. Catherine Ann Sullivan, known as Kate to her friends. Jo Joanna Ertison Basterichia. Basterichia? I practiced that one so much too. Nicholas Alexander Visconti. Viran Wong. Alex James Williams. Stephanie Cuepo Wabi. Amelia Claire Wright. Alice Evelyn Yang. Are you ready to have a party? <laughs> okay, will our graduates please rise for the absolutely final conferring of degrees, my favorite moment each year when the graduating class is all together for one last time. Having completed the requirements for the Master of Fine Arts or Master of Arts, I now confer on you these degrees with all the rights and privileges thereto attached. Congratulations. Our graduates, don't move, will now lead us out of this building to our amazing party, which will be behind Avery Hall. 
And once they have all processed, then we invite everybody in the room to follow them to Avery. We have a fantastic DJ, we have fantastic food, and we're gonna have a great time. Okay, congratulations. Thank you.
falling.